Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Donna Shaka, and I'm one of the American Liver Foundation's Community Education Managers. The American Liver Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit agency serving people with liver disease. We provide a voice for patients with liver disease and their families through education, support, research, and advocacy. Our mission is to promote education, advocacy, support services, and research for the prevention, treatment, and cure of liver disease. Next slide, please. This is just a brief disclaimer. We are going to be recording this webinar on the Zoom platform. So just please take a moment to review this disclaimer, which is required for any of our programs in which video, audio, or photography is included. These are just some details for Zoom. Again, we are recording this webinar and this will be available on our YouTube channel um, probably within the day or so. And attendees will receive a link via email to that, uh, to that uh, Zoom recording. For Q&A, we are going to do this at the end of the webinar. So we're going to have our speakers do their presentations. If you have questions about anything that's happening during the webinar, uh, questions you want asked at the end, which is when we will do our Q&A, please use the Q&A feature that you'll see if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see Q&A. So please enter your questions there and we will read them at the end and have our best speakers answer them. Um, again, we're, everybody is muted for this presentation, so the raising of the hand and the speaking will not be a feature that we're using in this particular webinar. We want to thank, with gratitude, our sponsors for this webinar. Um, our sponsors are Salix, ASI, and Yale New Haven Health. Their support is greatly appreciated. We couldn't do these programs without them. We have three presenters who are going to speak this afternoon or uh, this evening, depending on where you are. Um, we want to thank them for their time, their volunteering of their time and expertise to do this. And I've had the pleasure of working with these wonderful women before. Um, so I'm going to introduce them each now and then turn the, the uh, webinar over to them. Susan Zapatka is a nurse practitioner who received her undergraduate and graduate degrees at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut. She has a diverse healthcare background in private office, community health centers, clinical research, and health care grant administration. She is affiliated with the VA Connecticut Healthcare System West Haven Campus and Yale New Haven Hospital. She is committed to interprofessional, team-based, patient-centered care. Sarah Gillespie Heyman is a palliative care APRN at the VA Connecticut Healthcare System and serves as a primary clinician for the palliative care consult consultation team at this facility. She obtained her BSN from Fairfield University and her MSN from Yale University. She joined VA Connecticut over five years ago and comes from extensive background in critical care both as an RN and as APRN. She has been certified in hospice and palliative care since 2017. Dr. Simona Jacob is Associate Professor of Medicine at Yale University in the Section of Digestive Diseases, Firm Chief of the Klatskin Liver Inpatient Service at Yale New Haven Hospital, and Staff Hepatologist at VA Connecticut Healthcare System. She is an experienced clinician, educator, and investigator in several clinical trials. She is a fellow of the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease and a committee member of National GI and Liver Societies. She is passionate about improving the inpatient and outpatient management of patients with cirrhosis, in particular transitions of care, and multidisciplinary collaboration with addiction medicine and palliative care. So with that, I turn this presentation over to our wonderful, wonderful speakers. Hi, I'd like to give you a brief outline of this evening's presentation. We're going to take you on a journey of one of our patients and their families to demonstrate what palliative care can do for both the patient and the family members. It also is going to describe the benefits of palliative care for liver patients, understanding that it's a transition period of time.
from our VA. I met this gentleman in his family. He was a 92 year old veteran. He had chronic hepatitis C. He did not have advanced liver disease cirrhosis at this time. He had been, whoop, excuse me, the slide move. He was admitted in an outside hospital in July, 2020 with worsening abdominal bloating or distension. In June, 2013, he had an emergent procedure done due to a liver lesion was ruptured. It was a very large lesion, nine centimeters is quite large. And it was unfortunately found out to be liver cancer. In 2013, September, he was transferred to the VA in all of his care. In January, 2014, he had a CAT scan, luckily following up from that procedure that did not show that he had recurrent cancer. In October, 2014, the cancer did come back. December 2014, he underwent a special procedure that we are blessed to have to treat liver cancers today. And this procedure is called a TACE and it's a one overnight procedure at the hospital. And after his TACE, he had no recurrence after we imaged him. And he went for two more years, January 2016, almost two, um, where another reoccurrence came in. In February 2016, he again went through another taste procedure without follow-up recurrence. And then June 28, recurrence did occur. And in July 2018, we engaged palliative care consult. At first, the veteran was a little bit unsure if he wanted to get palliative care, worrying that it was hospice. And we explained that it was really more of a transition towards the end that we will all sometimes face that would be a hospice potential, but it would also be support for his wife at home and his children. And his children are very, very involved in his care as well as their significant others. So he has a son that lives by, he tries not to bother that son um, because he's busy, he runs his own business. He has a daughter who lives in Florida, both their children are married and they all have grandchildren. His famous hobbies, or his favorites, I should say, are hunting and fishing and gardening. So in July 2018, he came in for his palliative care consult. He really had no symptoms, thankfully. He was just very frustrated that here he goes again, all these years later, meeting another procedure. We had advanced directives in the chart from 2016, and we did need to update them but he was not really sure at this moment and didn't want to really make any significant you know, decisions to, at this point. So we try to talk about goals of care with families and that's what we do to set aside what are we going to do for medical care, psychosocial care and planning for another treatment or planning for other procedures. So September, 2018, cancer's back. It's a very large lesion in the right part of the liver. Um, at this point in time, going in to do another embolization or another procedure would unfortunately compromise or damage too much of his healthy liver, and it would lead to him not feeling well at all and potential a lot more damage. In February 2019, after meeting with oncology and already being involved with palliative care, he decided to go on a form of a pill type of chemotherapy. Um, March and April, he unfortunately had very severe side effects from the serafinib. He ended up with a very acute pancreatitis, so very severe abdominal pain, and the treatment had to be discontinued. So in April 2019, we did undergo a family meeting, understanding that there were not other options to treat his disease. And all along, we've been encouraged him to focus on his quality of life rather than the prognosis of the actual liver cancer itself. And our palliative care team's role is supporting his goals and managing any symptoms that he may experience or issues that the family may need. In November, 2019, he caught his first deer of the season hunting with his crossbow. He no longer used a crossbow with his own strength. He actually had an electronic crossbow. He still had a fairly good appetite. His son comes by every day. His daughter checks in every day from Florida, whether it be a telephone or a FaceTime. 
or one of the Alexa movements so that they could see each other. His wife started feeling better. She had experienced a, almost a year long period where he was really a caregiver to her, very strong individual. And they each get to play day by day by taking care of each other. And to their daughter's dismay, they would refuse to move to Florida. That was what happened, unfortunately. And she really wanted him, both of them to come down, but they refused. March, 2020, sometime later, he's still meeting with his friends. He's still doing yard work. And he's actually preparing his garden for the spring. His appetite remains strong. July, 2020, he unfortunately had an unexpected admission to the hospital where his abdomen bloated. He had severe shortness of breath. We performed a CAT scan to see what was going on. And during that, we found that he had a significant progression of his liver cancer, including some pleural fluid or fluid along in his lungs. This was the beginning of the end of our journey. At this time, I did a family video meeting with his daughter first, um, explaining what we had. She was in Florida. This was, of course, during COVID time where people were not able to come right in. We want to honor all of his wishes for end of life. So we spoke with the daughter and her husband or son-in-law. And Dr. Jacob and I went to the hospital room with Sam, our palliative care social worker. We went to give him the news, but we went together and we were able to FaceTime with his daughter it was, and, and son-in-law. So we prayed together. He's a very Catholic man. We had tears together as well. Um, he was discharged with home hospice and then eventually did come inpatient to the VA for hospice. He did pass away peacefully at VA Connecticut. And the things that the family were so happy for, all the affairs were in order. The services were able to take place in four days after his passing from having the goals of care and this planning set in place with the assistance of palliative care. And even though during COVID there was a small ceremony and today we are all blessed that we were able to attend that service. The family reminds us and they still would communicate that this team approach from liver, oncology, and palliative care has benefited all of their needs. And I will be passing on to Sarah. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Gillespie Heeman, and I'm going to be talking with you all about different options of how palliative care can assist with patients with end-stage liver disease. So this first graphic here in front of you is a really great illustration of being able to tell when somebody is first diagnosed with a life-altering illness and ultimately an illness that will perhaps shorten their life or end their life. And at the start of diagnosis is actually ideally when palliative care should be involved with both the patient and the family to help with both symptom control and making sure that we're alleviating any distress and making sure the family and patient have the best quality of life. So rather than having somebody like myself coming into the picture nearing the end of their life, really coming in at the start of the diagnosis, even while that individual is still receiving curative treatment, we find can greatly benefit all that are involved in the patient's care. And of course, as the patient's symptoms and disease declines, and then we eventually recognize that there is no cure and curative treatments are stopped and really we're focusing on symptom management completely at that point is when we involve hospice care. So the palliative care providers can help initiate the hospice level of care. And eventually our team also helps with bereavement support after that individual has passed away. And so we're really there with the family from start of the disease to really the end and even the after. So the definition of palliative care, according to the World Health Organization, is really an approach that helps look at 
quality of life for their patients, for patients and their families. And really our goal is to prevent and relieve suffering. And we do this by meeting folks early on in their disease prognosis and being able to assess them, treat their pain, for instance, and any other problems that could be affecting them, whether it's physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. And again, we're there for both patient and family members. And the definition of hospice, on the other hand, is really the focus is entirely on care and comfort rather than cure. So at this point, the patient has an illness that we know we cannot cure. We're not going to be doing any more curative treatments like chemotherapy, for instance, and really fo focusing entirely on the comfort of that individual. And our goal, as well as the patient's and the family's goal, is really to have a death without suffering and with preservation of dignity throughout the entire process. So just some very basic definitions to define between hospice and palliative care. Hospice care, when I think of hospice, I'm thinking of somebody who has a less than six month prognosis. And again, the goals are comfort oriented. We're not doing aggressive medical therapies anymore. The therapies that we are doing are focused on symptom management and helping make however much time they have the best time possible. So thinking about quality of life versus quantity versus palliative care where we can come in at any stage of somebody's illness, whether it's at first diagnosis or in the middle when they're still receiving chemotherapy, for instance, and we come in and really help support that individual and help out alleviate symptoms that are very distressing. And the goal is not limited to comfort. Like I said, we can do this um, coinciding with aggressive medical therapies. And again, the big difference is palliative care can coexist with curative treatments. So with radiation, with chemotherapy, et cetera, and surgeries. So who do we think about when we refer to palliative care? So in our case, in the liver clinic, we think about somebody who has advanced cirrhosis, even those patients who are being considered for liver transplant. I've met many individuals who are in the process of being considered for liver transplant and who come to our team who might have difficult symptoms that they need to have managed better. Somebody who has recurrent cirrhosis complications, for instance, if they have a lot of confusion that is becoming very challenging to modify at home, especially for their loved ones to witness, we can come in and help alleviate some of those symptoms. Someone who has weight loss, greater than 10% of body weight in less than six months, maybe we can think about adding a medication to help stimulate their appetite or even referring them to our nutrition colleagues as well. We also see folks who do have liver cancer who have frequent procedures, frequent cases like Sue just mentioned, or receiving systemic therapies with our oncology colleagues. Or what about if somebody just has a lot of psychological distress, who's feeling anxious, who's having depression, um, really kind of needing that extra support in addition to their liver team and oncology team. And of course, as I've mentioned before, we are there for the family members as well, families and friends, whoever the patient calls their family to help with any caregiver distress, which does come into play quite frequently with a lot of our patients. So some different palliative care myths. You know, one of my most common comments that I get from a lot of my patients is, oh no, I don't want hospice. I'm not ready for that. And just to know that again, palliative care is not hospice and believe it or not, even some providers mix up the two. So it's not just patients and families that you know may not fully understand the difference between the two disciplines. But I think just from a provider standpoint, you know, they may say, I want to help my patients not to give up on them. And they think by getting palliative care involved, that means giving up. And I just want to, you know, alleviate people's fears that 
It's actually supportive care, palliative care. And we are, in addition to the care that you're already receiving by your primary care physicians, by your liver doctors, by your oncology doctors, you know, we're not replacing anybody who's already caring for you. And really our goal is to provide relief from symptoms and from stress of illness. And to also, when we need to, visit goals of care. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And of course, our bottom line is to help improve the quality of life for patients with advanced chronic illness. Again, not so much thinking about quantity, but quality of days that one has, regardless of prognosis. The following slides, I mentioned different symptoms that folks with advanced liver disease sometimes experience. And some of the different interventions that we do as palliative care providers to help alleviate these symptoms. So very commonly fatigue and insomnia, which sometimes I see together because a lot of my folks don't sleep well. So we might consider giving them a small dose of a medicine called trazodone, which sometimes helps with their sleep, but doesn't give them that hangover effect the next morning. Um, we also might think about what is their sleep hygiene? Are they drinking coffee all day? Are we limiting it to one cup a day? Are they not getting enough protein in their diet? Do they need to have a, a visit with nutrition? Are they fatigued because they're just not able to move around as well? Do we need to think about physical therapy? Another symptom could be itching. So we usually start with various lotions. Um, especially if somebody is on medications called diuretics that help make you urinate more and get off fluid, itching is very common and that dry skin, kind of scaly skin. We tend to reserve the um, pill forms for anti-itching in folks that aren't having ongoing issues with confusion because we don't want to make that confusion worse. So we try to do um, interventions with lotions to begin with. If somebody is having nausea and vomiting, you know, there are a lot of different medications to give for nausea, as I listed here. Um, unfortunately, you know, one of the medications commonly used for confusion or encephalopathy is lactulose, and that could sometimes be causing somebody to feel nauseous. So kind of educating people that that could be a potential side effect or if they have that distended belly, that large, you know, pregnant looking belly that is filled with a lot of fluid, that could be causing them to be nauseous as well. As well. So we coach patients and families to try to have small frequent meals and have frequent snacks, especially a snack, you know, before bedtime generally can help a little bit with that nausea. And again, Decreased appetite is also seen as well. There are some medications we can use to intervene upon that. But again, those small frequent meals are really super important and one of the biggest interventions we start with. So bloating from that you know, big abdomen, we can sometimes adjust the lactulose or maybe use something else as a laxative like Miralax if, they're con if a person's constipated. Um, abdominal cramps, again, we want to make sure that there's nothing urgent going on and emergent going on with somebody, but we can think about different pain management interventions for them. And one of our most common symptoms that, you know, we deal with often is something called ascites, which again is that very large abdomen that's filled up with fluid. And so one of the most common, um, management is actually using diuretics, which is that medicine to help people urinate more frequently. But again, there are side effects to those medications. So kind of just making sure that everyone involved is aware of them and really discussing the expectations. You're never going to have a washboard stomach, um, even with diuretics. So that is not a realistic expectation, but to have a stomach that is more manageable and not causing shortness of breath is probably more realistic. We don't always consider narcotics because of some other side effects. Um, and another intervention is called a paracentesis, which some of you all may have had, 
where we actually take out fluid with a needle and it's done as an outpatient procedure in most cases in the hospital and it can provide fairly instant relief. And some of the others listed here are more invasive procedures that are done if we can't help um, the ascites with our more common interventions. And these are some other um, symptoms listed here, including muscle cramps, swelling in the legs called edema, pain, of course. We can start with a little bit of Tylenol for pain. If, the, if it's not uh, enough and the pain is, is resistant to that, we can do a low dose of something called tramadol, which I like to think of as a baby narcotic, but definitely no NSAIDs, no ibuprofen, no Aleve, et cetera, because of the bleeding risk and especially with someone with liver disease. And finally, we end some of our symptom management with thinking about psychological symptoms like anxiety and depression. You know, I feel very comfortable prescribing patients with an anti-anxiety medication, but if for some reason their anxiety and depression is, is so much that we need to involve some of our colleagues like psychiatry and psychology, we definitely are able to consult with those folks as well. So the next part of this is really talking about advanced care planning. And what I mean by that is thinking about your wishes. And one of the things that I always ask a patient to begin with is, first off, do you have an advanced directive? And what is an advanced directive? So it is a document that includes two different parts to it. And the first part designates a surrogate healthcare decision maker. So this is your person. This is the person who you would like to speak for you on your behalf if you are unable to. And really they are your voice. So ideally that person knows your wishes and really what you would wanna have happen in certain circumstances if your illness progresses or if things become more complicated. And the second part of an advanced directive is a living will. And this is really a guide. This is not a medical order. And certainly it can help guide your loved one in your wishes for treatment in certain situations. But again, it is not an order for the doctor to take, for instance. So it provides a guide at, at its basic level. Code status is a common term that we hear a lot in the hospital and, and truly it is a medical order, so different from the advanced directive, documenting your wishes if your heart were to stop or if you cannot breathe on your own, okay? So depending on the stage of your illness, interventions such as cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR will not be of benefit and it can actually potentially cause more harm and suffering than benefit. So again, none of these are written in stone. Code status can change as your illness progresses or doesn't progress and thing and you know wishes can be changed depending on that. And really your providers will ask you about your wishes when you're admitted, for instance, to the hospital or during clinic visits, and certainly if you've had a change in your illness, for instance, if your liver cancer has advanced. And again, you can change it at any time. Nothing is written in stone. So when should you start thinking about advanced care planning? Well, Anybody over the age of 18 should actually complete their advanced directive, regardless if you're healthy or not. So a lot of us have to practice what we preach, I admit to say, but certainly I think it's a great idea, especially if you have an advanced illness. So really, you have to get the necessary documents in order. So you can ask your primary care physician for a copy of an advanced directive that they can provide you. You can also find these documents online by simply doing a Google search and they're pretty simplified, but they are there. And finally, if you have a family lawyer or if you're wishing to obtain one, they can also help you um, get all the necessary documents in order. And I know there's also elder law attorneys as well that can be very helpful in this situation. It is best to have these documents notarized so that you can use them in any medical facility, 
Or if, for instance, you're traveling or maybe you're a snowbird and you live up here in the north in the summer and then south in the winter, that way you have them wherever you go and they're legalized. So who can provide palliative care? So I'm considered a palliative care specialist as a palliative care nurse practitioner who is certified in that. So, I, so a specialist palliative care provider is really part of a team of people who include social workers, chaplains, nurses like myself, and we coordinate with other clinical teams involved in the patient's care. So again, we are not going to be replacing anybody who is part of your care team. We are added in addition. We are a consultant. Now, there also can be primary palliative care providers. So these are not palliative care specialists, but these could be your primary care physician. Um, these could be disease-oriented specialists like in liver clinic or cardiology or oncology who are able to provide basic primary palliative care. And if there's tricky symptoms or tricky situations, they can gain support from our team as the specialist team. So in summary, supportive care, palliative care is supportive care providing relief from symptoms and stress of a serious illness such as liver disease. It can help at any age or stage of illness. It could help right in the beginning at diagnosis and we can be there throughout the illness and eventually transition to hospice and bereavement support. It does not replace other treatments and we as the team members do not replace other providers in your team. And it can offer an extra layer of support to improve the quality of life for both patients and their caregivers, which of course is our ultimate goal. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jacob. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, I'm Simona Jacob. Um, you heard from Sue about one of our patients' experience um, in uh, working with, I have to say our wonderful team. I'm very lucky to have such wonderful colleagues and friends. Um, and uh, you heard from Sarah what palliative care entails. So next we are going to talk about some details, some specifics of needs and um, uh, benefits of um, palliative care in liver clinic. Uh, briefly, uh, I will go over natural, the natural history of cirrhosis um, and keep in mind any liver disease could potentially lead to cirrhosis. Initially, in early stages of cirrhosis, the way we make the diagnosis is by liver biopsy or very specialized testing. And most patients with early cirrhosis, so these are patients with no complications from their liver disease, actually have um, uh, minimal or no symptoms and their survival is more than 12 years. As the liver disease progresses, complications such as variceal hemorrhage, ascites, or encephalopathy, uh, occur and um, uh, the patients unfortunately suffer from several symptoms. They need hospitalizations for repeated complications from their liver disease. And unfortunately in this um, uh, stage of cirrhosis, the survival drops to less than two years. And these are the patients who benefit the most from liver transplantation. That's why I wanted um, uh, everybody to understand that cirrhosis by itself doesn't mean much. There are so many phases of cirrhosis and each of our patients has a different story, a different uh, trajectory of their disease. Uh, as I said, patients with compensated cirrhosis, many of them don't even know they have cirrhosis. Patients with decompensated cirrhosis are the ones that suffer the most because of symptoms related to their disease. And I have to say many of the treatments we are doing, um, trying to help them. But uh, just keep in mind sort of the silver lining. Uh, I have several patients we are able to reverse the course of their disease or what we call recompensation by treating their underlying liver disease. So many patients who are able to maintain alcohol abstinence after being very sick in the hospital in intensive care unit. Now I see them twice a year. We check uh, blood work, um, imaging, but mostly we chat about their lives and their family's life. They are doing wonderful. We, uh, after we treat patients for their autoimmune hepatitis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, 
we can see significant improvement in their liver function and we can reverse what we used to call uh, decompensated cirrhosis. You already heard from Sarah about many symptoms our patients with liver disease have to face. And I just wanted to, you know, full disclosure, the regular hepatology care, regular care in the liver clinic, we are very good as uh, liver providers to deal with the cytis, fluid buildup in the abdomen, in the legs, confusion, and so forth. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Our patients and their families have to deal with so many other symptoms that Sarah already explained uh, the benefit of uh, having an experienced um, a provider, the relief they can, uh, um, they can offer uh, with these symptoms for many of our patients. In addition, patients with advanced liver disease such as cirrhosis can also get liver cancer. And um, the same way there are many phases of cirrhosis, there are many phases of liver cancer. And uh, as Dr. Teddy at uh, West Haven VA uh, likes to say, liver cancer actually is one patient having two diseases. So um, unfortunately, they have to deal with both the cancer and the cirrhosis. Most patients, though, they do have what I mentioned, uh, uh, what I call before compensated cirrhosis. So as far as their liver disease goes, they actually have minimal symptoms and their liver function is relatively okay, but their survival is profoundly impacted by their cancer diagnosis. For patients with liver cancer, we can also offer liver transplantation like we do for patients with decompensated cirrhosis. And although it's counterintuitive to treat cancer with a liver transplant, actually liver transplantation can be curative in certain, uh, certain patients. And that's why having a cancer diagnosis increases the likelihood of transplant because um, patients get priority points for liver transplantation. So sometimes the conversations in clinic can be very awkward. You know, usually when we have to discuss a cancer diagnosis with anybody, there is really no reason to rejoice, but uh, it can be very weird when we tell the patient, you know, I'm actually happy you got cancer because I can get extra points for you to get liver transplantation. So this is... Um, uh, very unique aspect that liver cancer in cirrhosis um, uh, can bring. Patients with liver cancer also face different types of challenges, um, different than patients with decompensated cirrhosis, but as much of an impact of, in their quality of life as for any patient with advanced liver disease. We have several treatment modalities these days to offer for patients with liver cancer. And a lot of times we keep pushing um, the envelope on, of trying different treatments to try to keep our patients transplantable, still to be able to offer them sort of the ultimate treatment, which is liver transplantation. But unfortunately, each type of this treatment comes with strings attached in terms of complications, hospitalizations, repeat procedures, and so forth. There is also palliative interventional radiology treatment for tumor burden. Unfortunately, if somebody has liver cancer and their liver disease, the underlying liver disease is very advanced and they do meet um, the definition for decompensated cirrhosis, the only treatment option is a liver uh, transplantation. And um, it's too bad nobody invented the crystal ball to give us the answers of what the future brings for our patients with cirrhosis and liver cancer. We are trying our best to advise our patients and their families appropriately. But as you will see, we are um, somehow limited in that regard. So uh, many of you might be familiar with the MEL score. This is, um, uh, was initially invented to see how people do after a uh, certain treatment of their fluid uh, build up um, in terms of something called TIPS, a liver stand. But then we realized that it correlates uh, relatively well with uh, the risk of death in patients with advanced liver disease. And it's a more objective way to try to uh, figure out who needs, uh, he, who needs to be first in line for a liver transplantation. So this MEL score is a very complicated formula taking into account 
certain blood tests, creatinine, bilirubin, and INR, and lately uh, sodium has been added to the equation. And at least on paper, looks um, like it's functioning quite well. The higher the score, the higher the chance uh, of dying because of um, uh, liver disease. But in reality, we rarely, actually, we never see this linear relationship that as time passes, the male score uh, gets higher and um, the patient uh, condition gets worse. Unfortunately, what we see in life is people who do just fine and then something happens, an infection or other complications, and their liver gets worse. And some people get a bit better, but maybe not as well as they were before. And then they have to suffer another complication and everything gets worse again. And it's a very fine line because unfortunately, you need the liver to be sick enough for priority as far as the liver transplantation goes, but patients shouldn't be too sick because then they cannot really survive such a huge surgery as a liver transplantation and they have a zero chance to, of recovery after that. So again, it's a very fine line of how sick one should be before uh, getting the liver transplant. So overall, unfortunately, what we learn every day when taking care of somebody with cirrhosis is that cirrhosis course is very unpredictable. And this uh, will certainly stress even more our patients and their families. And unfortunately, as much as liver transplantation is such a great treatment option, doesn't guarantee that good things will come to everybody who uh, wants to get a liver transplant. The reality is up to 18 to 20,000 patients are waiting these days for a liver transplant, but only about 6,000 liver transplants are performed each year. And uh, among patients waiting for liver transplant, we see 20 to 30% of them dying while waiting uh, to get transplanted. And while they are waiting, unfortunately, they have to go through repeat testing, invasive procedures, hospitalizations, more stress for their families as we ask them to reach out for potential uh, donors to give, um, to consider giving half of their liver for what we call a living, um, living donor liver transplant. And uh, overall, the challenges that our patients and their families face have to do not just with the symptoms and stress related to their disease and treatment, but also with the uncertainty. How is their disease gonna progress? Can they actually get a, get a liver transplant at some point? And um, many times uh, us as liver providers uh, fall short of discussing what's really important. What is the reality of transplant? The fact that we still have to deal with donor shortage, the high melt, to seek to transplant a uh, situation. When transplant becomes futile because it's unlikely uh, for a particular person to remain a transplant candidate. And as I said, this involves a lot of burnout for both patient and their family. And I hope um, uh, I convince you together with Sarah and Sue that there are so many benefits of uh, providing palliative care for our patients with liver disease such as it's very important to um, regard palliative care as interlinked with our usual hepatology care. So yes, we can combine liver or life-saving interventions with palliative care interventions because uh, depending where someone is in the course of their disease, they can certainly benefit from uh, both types, types of care. Fortunately, our liver community is becoming more and more uh, aware of the needs of um, our patients and how is the best way to meet those needs. So we have more materials we can use in clinic to discuss with our patients in terms of what is their liver disease, how advanced it is, what we, you know, how to guesstimate the future. Although, as I said, uh, it's really, um, difficult. So um, we are very lucky at the VA liver clinic in Connecticut. We started back um, in 2016. We are getting close to our five-year anniversary. 
seeing, um, uh, having patients see both liver providers and, pali and our palliative care team. And as you heard from Sarah, we want uh, our patients to benefit from palliative care earlier in the course of their disease. So once they start showing signs of complications from their cirrhosis or they have more uh, stressful procedures related to their liver cancer or they need uh, systemic uh, therapy. In addition, uh, our um, uh, liver clinic is part of um, a multi-center study, a national multi-center study, looking specifically at um, uh, what Sarah mentioned, the different types of palliative care services by a specialist such as Sarah or a trained uh, liver provider like me and Sue, recognizing that we have to, we just simply don't have enough palliative care specialists to go around as much as we like them. <laughs> so we have to try to uh, meet our patient needs in any uh, way uh, possible. So again, I'm very lucky to uh, be part of such a wonderful team. And um, uh, thank you again for inviting us to present on uh, this topic that is very dear to our hearts. And uh, we hope um, this way we can um, help you and uh, help your families. And uh, we are uh, definitely looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much for that. That's an excellent presentation. And um, as, as we were saying before we actually started recording, um, as we uh, start, before we started recording, as, as someone who's uh, had family members uh, utilize palliative and hospice care, this is a, a true um, benefit for people. Um, so I have a question here for that came through. Um, does the palliative medical team see the liver patient during the liver evaluation and are they present at the selection conference? So although it's a palliative care question, I'm gonna take it because um, um, I, um, um, I used to be part of the liver transplant team at Yale. Now I'm part-time PA, so uh, I still uh, practice as a transplant hepatologist, but unfortunately, the liver transplantation world has to catch up a little bit with what the hepatology providers are doing. So the short answer is no. So um, we do provide palliative care in our regular liver clinic, but um, uh, so far palliative care is not uh, part of the liver transplant evaluation. And uh, the same stands for um, Yale Transplant Center. Although we do have, um, uh, palliative care at Yale, they are not doing as uh, good as we do here because palliative <laughs> care at Yale is available only in the inpatient setting, unfortunately. They don't have the manpower to cover outpatient setting, but um, uh, they are not involved uh, in uh, the liver transplant evaluation process. Okay, thank you. We have another question here, and that is, do you have a palliative medical social worker and a liver transplant social worker both follow with the patient once the patient is listed? So uh, for uh, the patients we have uh, at the VA uh, on the liver transplant list, we do maintain the connection with the palliative care team, including uh, a social worker. The way that, uh, the liver transplantation uh, process is at the VA, we have only five centers for liver transplantation at the VA. So um, we send our patients, for example, the closest center to us are Richmond and um, Pittsburgh. So um, honestly, the social worker in the transplant team, let's say just an example for Richmond or for Pittsburgh, they don't um, have such um, hands-on uh, interaction with our patients because they are remote. So I have to say our patients benefit more from their local uh, social workers and um, uh, from our palliative care team. And um, you know, from what I know from uh, my colleagues in other transplant centers, again, the social worker associated with the transplant team is um, the primary social worker involved with the patient. And this is because not everybody um, 
is lucky to have the type of co-localized care that uh, we do it in our liver. Okay, um, another question that um, that comes to mind here is, you know, we, we hate to think of anyone dealing with uh, chronic illness or serious illness, but is palliative care an option for children who have advanced liver disease or any, any health problem? That's a great question. So yes, there are actually specific pediatric palliative care providers out there. They are definitely very limiting though. Um, you know, I know in the state of Connecticut through Connecticut Children's Hospital, they have a palliative care team that will work with kids who have advanced liver disease or liver illnesses, but it's really hard, especially in remote areas in the country, you're not gonna find a specific pediatric palliative care, but there is, um, there are boarded, board certified physicians and other practitioners specifically to pediatrics. Okay, thank you. Um, one thing that was brought up a few times um, through the presentation uh, is the family members, the, the, the people who are at home with the, the ailing person. Um, and I know with hospice care, there is an opportunity for respite services. Is, is that something that, that can accompany palliative care as well? Or is that really more of a hospice thing where, where family members or caregivers can get a little bit of a break if need be? That's also a great question. Actually, here in our center, we have a, um, a unit called our Community Living Center that does offer respite for veterans who don't always have to be hospice level of care or even palliative care, quite frankly, um, for those very, you know, caregivers that are just feeling quite burdened, which is very understandable. And so there are certain um, timeframes that they can stay during the year. But yes, we try to accommodate. COVID has obviously thrown a little bit of a wrench into that. But typically speaking, we do offer respite care to quite a few of our veterans here. And I have to say the families that have been able to utilize that, it just gives them that renewed sense of you know, strength to be able to still be a caregiver, even if it's just a two week you know, respite, it's been very helpful. So yes, we, we take advantage for that for both palliative hospice and not even palliative hospice. Yeah, as the saying goes, if you can't take care of yourself, you're, you're not going to be good for other people. So that's a good point. Um, for medication administration, um, again, palliative and hospice, are there any, you know, if somebody has, an, say, a spouse who is, um, you know, not comfortable with all the medication regimens and help them with the medications, are, are palliative and hospice uh medical staff allowed to administer the medication in, in place of the caregiver doing it because again the, the team the medical team isn't living with the with the family so right. is there help for people if they feel unsure when there's this medicine cabinet worth of, of stuff to be giving out yeah that that can be a little tricky um the honest answer is unfortunately as you said the medical team can't be there all the time. And so that certainly if they're there for a visit and they see that the patient is uncomfortable or, you know, nauseous, for instance, they can certainly administer that medication. But really, I, I hate to say this, but hospice care at home and palliative care at home, a lot of it falls on the family. And I think that's where we have to have some larger discussions if it is becoming too much, whether physically, emotionally, and all of the above, we sometimes need to think about other locations for that loved one to be um, to be placed, whether it's inpatient hospice, whether really their level of care is really nursing home level of care. But unfortunately, in the current environment, there are not enough hospice providers or nurses to go to homes all the time to administer meds. Um, they can certainly educate and educate a lot and be able to arrange them in, you know, pillboxes and separate them for nausea, pain, shortness of breath, and so forth, but they can't be there realistically all the time. And, and as we often know, so many things happen overnight or on the weekends or, you know, in the hours when you feel like yeah. nobody else is there. 
I will say that our hospice agencies we work with, and I think this is pretty um, standard, there is always an on-call nurse. And so if the family member like 2 a.m. realizes, oh my gosh, I don't remember what drug to give my husband for this or that, you know, typically speaking, they can call, and that goes for palliative care as well. They can call an on-call person who may not be their nurse, but can at least guide them in what to give and how to give it. Sort of a lifeline. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. It's stressful for everybody, you know. So Definitely. that's good to know. Um, and I think the last thing I just we we have a couple of extra minutes is um, how is this all paid for? Does insurance cover this? Is this a Medicare uh, covered service or Medicaid? You know, how, and how does that get coordinated? Is there a financial person that helps with that? So I'm very lucky here in our VA system. All of my patients are veterans, obviously, and um, under being a, a benefit of being a veteran is you are eligible for hospice level of care. So automatically they do get that benefit. But if we need to, for instance, if let's say they're 50 years old and I wanna get palliative care in and they don't quite have Medicare yet because they're only 50, then we usually tap, we sometimes have to do Medicaid or Title 19. And sometimes the VA will actually pay. Um, it, it depends on circumstances. Um, but if they're over 65, certainly we tap into their Medicare benefit um, for hospice. But again, palliative care gets a little iffy. Um, a lot of times we, we can have the VA pay as a source, a payer source. And again, I'm very lucky. I have not had to do this in the community before. So I know as a palliative care provider in the community, it can be very challenging to get palliative home care. Like you basically have to be I, on your deathbed to really qualify for certain things. So um, again, our veterans, we, we have that great benefit here. Okay. Well, I think that was the final question. So thank you for the presentation and for answering the questions. It's a tough subject, but it's good to, to know it and be prepared. Um, so having said this, I guess what I'm going to do is again, thank profusely our, our wonderful sponsors. Um, for their, for their assistance in, in all of our programming here. This was really helpful. Um, everyone who participated in this webinar will be receiving a little a program evaluation uh, via email. So we would love it if you could fill that out. And you will also receive what we call a palliative care toolkit, which shows uh, resources that you can access about palliative care, as well as our online information for, about palliative care. Um, we have a helpline at 1-800-GO-LIVER. The number is here, 1-800-465-4837. So we invite you to certainly contact us if you need more information, and we'll do our best to help you in whatever way we can. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you to our speakers. You were great, as always. And uh, with that, we will close out the webinar. Good night. Thank you.